intended to read to you the first, what was the first nine verses, and, and I imagined to myself as I was trying to make my little notes that I probably won't get out of verse one in the preaching, so y'all bear with me. I'll finish it up tonight, okay? So what I want to do is I want to read through it first, nine verses. I'll come back and preach verse one, and then part two maybe this evening, okay? So here it goes. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the, can you see that capital letter? After the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. And in fact, in His flesh. He that knew no sin became sin for us. Amen? And that's where he got condemnation at. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You reckon he's trying to drive that point home? And verse number 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then... They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But then, but now ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Before I go back to verse 1, I want you to understand verses 7 and 8. It says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, can, and neither indeed can be. Uh, the Jews got that all mixed up. The Israelites thought that the law was given to them as a set of rules to try to live by. And if they could attain themselves to those rules, they could attain righteousness. You and I know that's not the truth, right? Amen. That's not the way it is. I mean, you, you, could, try, you could keep all the law. We met a, we met a fellow who come to Jesus Remember him, a young ruler who said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what does the law say? He says, oh, I've kept all of that from my youth up. I ain't never broke one of them. And yet Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. So you could keep all the law and you still wouldn't be righteous in the sight of God. And this verse says that the Jews believe that somehow that the law was about trying to um, corral your fleshly desires and keep you on a chain from going out and doing the things that you really desire to do, but yet you resist. I know so many people that are proud saying, Brother Buddy, you've been proud of me. I wanted to take his head off, but I didn't. I wanted, I wanted to just rip him a new one. I want to tell him all about myself. But I didn't do, and they pray, but, but I, I'm, I'm part way proud of you because you didn't do that. But I want you to know what God expects of us, that the, that the desire to want to do it yeah, amen. has been erased. Amen. That's right. that's, because that's a big difference, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a whole big difference for you to go up to a yard where you see a bulldog chained to a logging chain. And you know that the only reason he ain't eating your leg off right. is because he's on that chain. That's right. Whole big difference than whenever you go in a yard where you got a puppy coming up to you licking you on your hand. Whole big difference. The difference is the heart of that animal. And I'm telling you, the difference is the. And so he said, so then verse number eight, he says, so then they, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So in trying to do your very best, and I want to get this off my plate right off the beginning. Trying to do your absolute very best, and I know there's some good people here today. 
But your goodness does not measure up to the righteousness of Christ. In fact, the Scripture tells us that the best you've ever been is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. The best you ever done. Because so your goodness is not what he was ever trying to measure. Your goodness is what it was not what he was trying to attain. Your flesh is not subject to the law of God. It cannot be. This is a spiritual situation. Your problem is not a problem of how you behave. Your problem is a problem of who you are. That's why you must be born again. That's, I'm talking to every one of us here today. Listen. So, in verse, verse number one, I'm going to try to back up and preach that one verse because I got about 15 minutes. I got to cram it in. I want you to hear verse number one of chapter eight says, There is therefore now no condemnation. That word therefore means that Paul has been preaching a uh, 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 daisy chaining together some ideas uh, from his oratory. He's trying, to, he's trying to bring together some, he's been laying some found, foundational um, uh, work in, in the first seven verse chapters of the book of Romans. He's been laying some stuff down, and in chapter seven, man, he really began to talk about how that the law of sin was, was demolished by what Jesus done. That the law, the law of, the law of uh, Moses, the law of sin and death was crushed because Jesus came in and fulfilled it, and he took it out of the way. And at the end of 7, he moves into chapter 8 and in verse number 1, he says, because of that, because of what I just taught you, there is therefore now no condemnation. Do you know what the law brought to the children of Israel? Condemnation. Every time they turned around, when they broke a rule, they got told about it, and they had to go make some kind of an offering or a penance before the Lord every, every single time. And that was, to, that was to remind them of what they had done, how grievous it was in the sight of God. Can you imagine living in a relationship where every time you do something, somebody tells you how wrong it is? Don't look at your, don't look at your spouse. Don't look at you. That ain't right right there. You live in a relationship where, where nothing you do, nothing you do is pleasing. It's always falling short of meeting their expectation. That's exactly what happened when God gave the law. Now, if you ever thought that God gave the Ten Commandments so that we can live up to that, then you're in the same mindset that the Jews were in. It was never given to them for them to live by. It was given, Mike, to show them that they could not, they could not match up to the right. It was, it was a measure stick say, here's the righteousness of God, and here you are. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. That's what God was trying to do. So the Apostle Paul says, after what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, and through his indwelling Holy Spirit that now lives in us, we have power that we never had before. Amen? We've been set free from the law of sin and the law of death. The, the, the power of God, Donnie, now lives inside of me. You, you know about that, don't you? Does he live in you? Does he live in you? He lives in us, every one of us. When you've been saved, you now have a delivering power of God dwelling in you. God, the Holy Spirit, taking up residence in you for the purpose of empowering you to live the life that God has called us to live. Because it is a work of the Spirit. I told you that in these verses I just read to you, in those verses you'll see where it talks about the Spirit. And almost every time up to the end of my reading, the word Spirit was capitalized indicating we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Walking with the Holy Spirit. Now this is what I want to teach you this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation. That word now. Some people keep thinking that when we get to heaven in the by and by, that's when we're going to be made complete in God's sight. There's some truth to that. We will lose this old carnality. But I want you to know right now in the sight of God right now, amen. in the sight of God right amen. this minute, amen? amen? I mean, from the day that I trusted Him as my personal Savior, from that very moment, amen, right now, in the here and now, I am clean because He said so. Amen. amen. 
Now, I know you might see differently, but when he sees me, all he sees is the blood. Amen. All he sees is the payment that was made for my sin. So the Apostle Paul says, right now, right now you don't have any condemnation. You don't have to worry about measuring up to the commandments of the law because Christ met those commands for you. There is therefore now no condemnation. How many? None. That, that's the idea that, that there's, there's no um, record, there's no charge that can be leveled against me as a believer. To them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So here we go. No condemnation means that there, that there are no condemnable, condemnable uh, features or flaws or actions in me that can be charged against me. Listen carefully to me. Having no condemnation means that I have immunity. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. What it means is I have no condemnation of my imperfection. That's right. I have been pardoned. I've been set free. It's been paid for already. It cannot be imputed unto me. The devil tries. Oh, he wants me to think about the things I've done. He wants to condemn me. He wants me to feel like, and listen, he's right. I am I'm guilty of those things, but they've been paid for in full. Amen. And, and, and in God's eyes, all he sees is the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation. Imagine this, before a holy God, the creator God of this universe that demands 100% holiness in you, and he looks at you and says, clean, no condemnation. And you're going like, really? Does he know about? Yeah, he knows. He know about, yeah, he knows about that too. He knows about all of it. His son carried it away as far as the east is from the west through his sacred blood and shed on Calvary. What an amazing thought this is. No condemnation. It don't mean you, you didn't have it coming. It means that he says, I choose to take that away. He removes it from us. I'm grateful for that. Man, I'm so happy. Because the Israelites lived under condemnation constantly. Do you know John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved? Do you know 317, for God sent not a son in the world to condemn the world? Because the world was condemned already. Already under condemnation. I mean, you know what I don't need? I don't need somebody to tell me I'm missing the mark. Right. I know that. I know that. Yeah. Woo! What I needed to find out and what set me free was when somebody told me about chapter 8, verse 1, that says, hey, somebody hit the mark for you. Somebody took it out of the park. Man, somebody cleaned it all up, and there's nothing left of condemnation. Not one thing. I'm, I know I'm hanging on this point, but I can't get away from it. Because I, I got so many things that I'm guilty of. I can't imagine being set free. How could somebody so wicked as me suddenly, just by faith and trust and grace of the Son of God, be set free and clean? Oh! I don't know how. But I can tell you this. I'm glad of it. Because without it, none of us will make it in. Amen. You need to be happy about this doctrine of no condemnation. It means that you have the gift of receiving eternal life if you walk after the Spirit. Let me finish this. There's not, just, there's not even one charge that can be filed against me. <laughs> they, you can try. You can try. Uh, we, we used to sing a song all the time, and I said, look, you know, you can, you can shine a light and, and bring your brightest light you want to and search all you want to. You can hire the greatest lawyer, but even he can't find the evidence. Right. It's been covered by the blood. 
Verse, verse number one still says, um, to them which are in Christ Jesus. This no condemnation applies to a certain people. Somebody asked me the other day, do I believe in predestination? I said, absolutely. The Bible teaches us, and I think I put this out on the prayer chain sometime later. But I want you to know, yeah, absolutely, the Bible teaches predestination. But this is what I want you all to learn today, if you didn't already know this. People aren't predestined. It's the plan of God that's predestined. I, I read to you the other day on, on our morning devotion that the Bible tells us that salvation that God had written down before the foundation of the world, God knew what He was going to do. That's the predestination. God says, whosoever will get into that ark. Right, Ray? Whosoever will get into that ark shall be saved. Why? Why? Because he's already predetermined that whosoever will, who will ever come in, will be safe and kept for all eternity. And this verse says that this, con this no condemnation is to all of them which are in Christ Jesus, have trusted in the sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross of Calvary. That's what it's talking about. Remember I told you a couple of services ago that the new covenant wasn't made between God and us. The new covenant was made between the Father and the Son. It was the Son that says, Father, I'll go pay the cost. The Son said, you pay the cost and me and you got a deal. You pay the cost and all that will put their trust in you shall receive the same gift that you have. And that will be the gift of eternal life. That's what he told him. It's the, it's the contract that was made between the Father. And listen, the only way you can, can, can participate in this wonderful covenant is you must be in Christ. Yeah. You got to join His team. You got to surrender to Him. You got to be bought by His blood. To them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, notice this last part who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, this is not a condition of not having condemnation. In other words, I'm not saying to you that you got to try to walk in the Spirit in order not to be condemned. I'm telling you that this is a result of being in Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus and if you trusted Him, you will walk after the Spirit. Listen to me. I know there's some carnal Christians too. I know there's people that still follow fleshly things. I'm talking about the definitions I want to share with you right now. Walking according to the flesh versus walking according to the Spirit. Some people are still, are still living after their sinful carnal nature. Nothing has changed except that they prayed a prayer somewhere. Maybe gone through a baptism or joined a church. And nothing has changed. Those people are walking after the flesh. I told you earlier that no condemnation doesn't mean you don't do anything wrong. So I'm not talking about your stumblings. I'm talking about your direction of aim. You're aiming the wrong way. And you are missing the target because you're aiming the wrong way. You're walking after the flesh. You're following after the rudiments of trying to be good enough, or you're trying to do something your own way, which is what the law was all about, so that you might have the honorable um, the position of being uh, forgiven by God Himself. But you cannot be walking after the flesh and be in Christ at the same time. Your nature, your nature is... I understand it's still sinful, but you now have something that I told you at the beginning of the service that I want to make sure, Brother Rick, get ready. I want to make sure that you don't ever forget, and that is the fact that the Holy Spirit now dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Now, I'm going to, I'm, I, don't get too excited, Rick. Walk real slow. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to hear you may be a witness for me this morning. You might be able to say, I, I know he knows what he's talking about because I've been there. If, if you might have, when you got born again, you might have recognized that immediately there was a struggle that started happening inside of you. You wanted to do right, 
and you kept finding yourself slipping and doing wrong. Don't raise your hand, but if you acknowledge that within yourself, if you know what I'm talking about, you find yourself slipping. And you say, Lord, forgive me. I don't want to do that anymore. I, I just got saved. I don't want to do that. And then you'd find yourself doing the same thing again. And then you say, Lord, I don't want to be that person anymore. Please forgive me. I, I'm, I understand enough. I know you got that nature. You know what was causing the struggle? You got the Holy Spirit dwelling in you now. You used to live that way, Chris, and it didn't bother you at all. In fact, you looked down your nose at all the others that didn't think you had it all figured out. Amen. But when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, every little thing you do, you go like, ooh, that ain't right. That ain't right. Who's telling you that? Holy Spirit knows. He's saying, you're not following me. You're still trying to go that old way. Come on. And the scripture says there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And then it says those folks, you'll know them because they're going to walk after the Spirit. I want to, I want to get this out and I'm, I promise I'm trying. This is a mark of those who know Jesus as personal Savior. I can tell you this because He changed me. I didn't change. He changed me. I tried changing me before. I fell, oh, I fell flat. I made a bigger mess than you could. Oh, baby. I messed it up. I, I, went, I tried to change. You know what I got was worse. I got worse. But he changed me to where now that it's my nature and my desire to want to seek after him. Do I miss? Oh, yeah, I miss. But man, I want you to know what I want. I want to be like him. I desire to be more like him. I am burdened when I miss the mark. I am ashamed of my sin. Where I used to not have all that. There's somebody in me, it ain't me, there's somebody in me that's standing up trying to bring me in the right path. That's how I know that I'm in Christ Jesus. Those that are in Christ Jesus have no condemnation, and it's not because they're not sinful anymore, not because you don't make mistakes, but it's because you have a sincere desire to want to be a living example of the Spirit of God. That's what I'm going to ask you this morning because I know there's a bunch of church people in here. You know, some of the roughest folks I ever met was church folks. Amen. Mm. And church folks, my daddy used to say, buddy, you can't get anybody saved till you get them lost. And most church folks think they're saved and everybody else is lost. As long as you don't, you know, if you're not going their way, then you must not have it figured out. But this morning, I want to share something with you. My greatest desire is that you will examine yourself and see if there's been a transformation in you that wasn't created or initiated by you. You ever notice when you try to make a change, you get worse? I mean, you, you get downright rebellious. It's remarkable to me, but it certainly happens that way. Uh, it happened with the prodigal son. Hey, he wanted to he wanted to try to change things, and he got nasty to his father, and he left home. Remember when he came back, though? All he said to the father was, uh, he practiced this. He didn't actually get it all out to daddy. Uh, he practiced it, and he said, I'm going to go back to my father. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee. Just make me as one of your servants. That's what he wanted to say. But before he could get it all out, daddy done smothered him up with a big old hug and kiss. And he brought him back into the family and made him a son, uh, the position of the son all over again. I'm telling you, listen to me carefully. It's a remarkable thing that when we try to straighten ourselves out that we get messed up. Maybe, maybe today you're going like, wow, that's why it's not working for me. I've been a church pastor for decades and it just hadn't worked for me. Maybe that's the reason. Because I don't ever feel like there's ever been a transformation, a real change in me. I've been the same person trying to do better. Amen. I'm with you there. I've been, I've been down that road. That road keeps running into the same wall, the same block wall. You can't get anywhere like that. Why don't you try this? 
Instead of trying to transform yourself, why don't you come to Him and just acknowledge all of your fault, the fact that you're a sinner and you're incapable of changing yourself. See what He will do. He'll deposit into you the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. When that happens, you now have the power to overcome this world and your own flesh. I want to, before I ask you to stand, I want you just, if you would, bow your head right where you are. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything like that right now. I just want you to think for just a moment. I want you to, I don't want you to be distracted by anybody around you or anything like that. But would you think for just a moment, ask yourself this question. Have I been transformed? Have I been transformed or have I been trying to just be a better me? Ask yourself that question, then be honest with yourself. If you've just been trying to be a better me, if you've just been trying to make yourself better without surrendering yourself, you need to be born again. And in a few minutes, we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to invite you to come to the altar, and I'm going to ask you to just tell it to Jesus. He's the one that saves you, not the pastor. I can't help you. I just want you to come to that realization Lord, I ask God right now for everyone that is looking within their own hearts. Lord, I know, I know there's, I've already seen it. I know there's somebody here uh, that needs to surrender. Help them to have the good sense to make it be today because the midnight cry could go out at any time and then our time is over. Please help us to know how urgent it is that we make it right today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd stand with me, please, if you'd stand, if you can, stand with me, Brother Rick's going to